So I love that you're all around the floor. It feels like library story time. <laughs> like, this is really making me happy. Um, I like to put up this slide. It's not true. It just makes you guys feel good for being here. Um, <laughs> so hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> my name's Erin McKean. I'm a developer uh, advocate at IBM. And I also am the founder of a website called WordNick. And tonight I'm going to talk to you about Loopback, which is an open source framework for making APIs with Node. That is um, it's open source, but it's sponsored by IBM. Um, it's based on Express. I'll tell you all about it. I'll show you actually how to create an API with Loopback in like under five minutes. Y'all can time me if you want. And then I'll show you how I use Loopback myself in production for WordNick. And I'll tell you what WordNick is. Maybe not in that particular order, but all those things will happen. So, oh, and there's my Twitter handle. And um, if you see a pink robot in the internet, it's probably me. It better damn well be me. I don't look like a pink robot in real life. I'm really sorry. Anyway, Loopback. So Loopback is a tool for generating Node REST APIs. It's open source, maintained by IBM, based on Express. It's free to use. And you can deploy a Loopback application anywhere you can deploy a Node application. And I love using Loopback because it's fast. I'm not saying perform it fast, although it is, you know, fairly performant. Like, you know, if you're working in Node and you need super performant code, you might be in the wrong place. Um, but yeah, it does what it says on the box. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if for, for certain values of performant, it does a really great job. And um, I like to talk about Loopback as being like cake mix. It's like cake mix for APIs. It gives you, yeah, you know, like, how many people here like to eat cake, right? Keep your hand raised if you like making cake as much as you like eating cake. Yeah, and it's the same thing. It's the same thing with APIs. I really like consuming APIs and having APIs to use more than I like creating APIs. So Loopback makes it fast. You know, like Cake Mix makes making cake fast, so you can get to the good part, which is the eating of it. Loopback makes making APIs fast so that you can get to the good part, which is using them. But just because it's cake mix doesn't mean that you can't trick it out, right? Like, you can do anything with a box of cake mix. There's probably like, I don't even want to know how many terabytes of YouTube are dedicated to like doing cool stuff with cake mix. And it's the same thing with Loopback. You can customize Loopback in about a gazillion different ways, and I'll show you how I've done that for WordNick. So the, the little uh, sample project, the non-WordNick project that I'll show you, just to show you how fast it is to make an API, is that I have this data set on my machine that is 200,000 Jeopardy questions in JSON format because some dude on Reddit scraped them, which is like the most grateful I've ever been to a dude on Reddit. <laughs> and so like, anyway, uh, <laughs> It's JSON, and it's beautiful JSON, and it's simple JSON, and it's a really fun data set to, to show off how loopback works. Um, I like to use loopback with real data whenever I can, because most of you are not working with fake data. You are trying to make applications that use real data in the real world. So, and of course, I have it in Mongo because Node. How many people here use Mongo? Yeah. So, you can actually use loopback with just about any database, and I'll show you that, but it's a Mongo. So this is what I've already done on my machine in order to make this work. I have Node, I have NPM. Loopback does not support Node prior to 4. You should not be using Node prior to version 4 anyway. But if this is what it takes to get you to upgrade, that's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have the CLI installed on my machine, and I have Mongo with this data locally running on my machine. So let's code. <laughs> All right. So let me make this bigger, a lot bigger. Tell me when to stop, people in the back row. That's good. All right. Too big? T too tough. <laughs> tough. This is what we got. Let me make the window a little smaller, though. OK, so I said I had the loopback CLI installed. So if I'm going to start a loopback application, I'm just going to type LB app. And it's going to ask me what the name of my application is. So let's call it JSLA and put it in that directory. It's going to create the directory. There are a couple different live versions of Loopback right now. Long-term support, version 3. I'm using version 3 because it's the newest and the shiniest. Version 4 is coming. It's going to be very, very different and way cooler. 
but there will be a nice calm smooth upgrade path they have all assured me that this will be what happens so i'm just going to make an empty server so you can make all sorts of like different flavors of loopback application from this command line api server includes local user auth but i'm not going to show you that today an empty server is just a plain api server and then there's a hello world example and a notes example but i like to work with real data so i don't use those examples so now all the friendly wombats at npm are going to do their thing and install the stuff. Your Wi-Fi is pretty good here. I'm impressed. <laughs> um, guess must not be downloading podcasts in the background or anything. Um, so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this is actually the hardest part of setting up a loopback application: remembering to switch into the directory you just created. Seriously, this this like trips you up more times than not. Okay. So I like to think, and so let's see what got created for us. So we got a client folder, we got a server folder, got a package JSON, package lock, and our no modules folder. So it looks like a pretty typical JavaScript application. Um, I like to think of loopback as like a three-legged stool. You've got this generated scaffold that just happened, that's one leg. And then you have the data source, which is how loopback knows where your data is. And then you have your model, which is how loopback knows what your data is shaped like. And so the next thing we set up is a data source. And I'm going to call it Mongo. Here are all the different databases that you can keep your data in for a loopback API. So in memory, key value, IBM's DB2 for some reason. Um, <laughs> all sorts of IBM databases. Cassandra, Redis, Mongo, MySQL, Postgres, Oracle. You can use it to proxy REST services and SOAP. SOAP, yes. Couchbase, Kafka, Elasticsearch. I actually use the Elasticsearch connector a lot. So some of these. Uh, ZOS. Um, some of these connectors are community supported in that uh, people who don't work for IBM make them, and some of them are supported by Strongly, which is the company that created Leadback that got acquired by IBM. So, um, and they're all pretty great. But the cool thing is, is that you just scroll through till you get what you want, and then you can set it up. And so, how many of you use a clipboard manager? That is not enough hands, people. Best thing ever. So Clipboard Manager lets you do really cool stuff like this, like save connection strings, because you know what? Life is too short to type the same goddamn things over and over again. <laughs> A Clipboard Manager, I, I use one called Copy and Paste. There are ones everywhere. Um, it lets you save like the last hundred things that you copied, so then you can paste them without having to go copy them again will save you so much typing and repetitive strain disorder and like hours of your life. And there are a lot of free ones. I pay for the one I use, which is called Copy M-E-M -E Paste, um, because I like to pay people for software, because then maybe someday people will pay me for software. <laughs> anyway, so I'm using this connection string. And because I'm using a whole connection string, which includes the host information and the port information and user and password database, I don't have to fill out those forms. And now, because I'm only using Mongo, I only have to install the connector for Mongo. So the Wombats have less work to do because we don't install all the connectors for the databases we're not using. OK, so now we have the app and we have the data source. So let's add a model. And um, pretty much the hardest part of uh, using Jeopardy questions as your data is remembering how to spell Jeopardy. <laughs> um, so here, I'm going to select the data source that I just created. And I'm going to use a persisted model, even though I'm not planning on adding any questions to this data set, but just in case I wanted to. And then, of course, I'm going to make it available through the REST API. I don't need a custom plural form. I'm going to put it in the common folder, which means it might be available to front-end code should I ever, ever feel the need to write any front-end code. Um, and now let's talk about what properties it has. I don't really feel the need to write front-end code very often. Um, and you, I just lie down until the feeling goes away. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so Jeopardy, Jeopardy questions have questions, right? And they're strings, and they're required. And they don't have a default value. And they also have answers, which are also strings and also required. They don't have a default value. Now, there was actually more data 
in our JSON, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to say that's it. So if I've done everything right and the demo gods are smiling, I should now have a full CRUD API connected to my database. So let's go see. Um, actually, I don't need to copy any of that. Um, so now you can see I called this application JSLA, right? So that's what it is. And um, I'm not going to get all the Jeopardy questions because it will make the browser hang to get 200,000 of them all at once. I'm going to go to find one. So all of these endpoints were created by loopback based on the information given in the model and the data source. So fingers crossed, let's see if we get one. Hey, all right, we got a question. So that is one of the questions in our data set. And I can show you that we have 200,000 questions available to us by going to the count endpoint and checking it out. 216,930. So that was really easy, right? Like cake mix level easy. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is one of the reasons why I love Leapback. Uh, and so you can do all sorts of cool things to customize it. Like you could, um, is everybody familiar with this particular kind of uh, API dashboard documentation thing? This is based on Swagger, which is now called the Open API Spec. So Loopback actually generates a uh, spec formerly known as Swagger Spec for you. And then you can use that spec to export it and do other things with it. But it, one of the things it does is generate this cool documentation, which you get for free out of the cake mix box with Loopback. So let's go back to the slides. All right. Um, so you can do a lot of fancy things. You can use custom ID values. This one just used automatically generated IDs from Mongo. You can add hooks at every part before and after each API call. So if you want to say validate data before it gets saved, you can add a hook that makes sure that happens. You can add boot scripts that happen when the app starts up. You can hide endpoints. There's a bunch of stuff you can do. And of course, you could build a front end once you have your APIs. Um, so Loopback is a framework, right? And there are lots of JavaScript frameworks. There's probably one every day. Probably somebody right now, instead of coming to this meetup, decided to stay home and write his or her own framework. But um, yeah, but I like using them for, this, for these reasons. I feel like a framework really makes the implicit assumptions about your code explicit because they have to be shared across a lot of people. You have to have a shared mental model with the other people using the framework. There's an ecosystem, right? There's a very active uh, Google group and Stack Overflow tags um, of people all working in the same framework that have the same kinds of questions, which promotes code reuse and allows you to learn from other people's mistakes, which is my favorite way to learn from mistakes. I really prefer to learn from other people's instead of making them myself. <laughs> And then they help you build faster. So here are a bunch of loopback resources. I'll come back to this slide later. But this is what I call the cell phone slide. If you're super interested, you can take a picture. Um, but I use loopback myself for WordNick. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what WordNick is. WordNick is the biggest online dictionary in the world that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> and so um, I used to be, before I started working on Wordnik, the editor-in-chief of American Dictionaries for Oxford University Press. And the number one question that people always asked me when I was a full-time dictionary editor was, why is it my favorite word that I really love not in your dictionary because you suck? Like, you know, um, yeah, that was like people would be upset if words that they loved weren't in the dictionary. And I would have to give them kind of a boring answer, which is we don't have enough money and time to write definitions for all the words in the world. And they would say, I don't like that answer. And so like it really wore on me after a while. And I was like, why is this the case when we now have the internet, which is essentially infinite, and we could pretty much have space for all the words if we don't have to put them on paper? Like even these words, right? We, would, we could take the dictionary and put in everything. And as someone who really loves words like more than you ought to, this is what I wanted to have happen. And it turns out that there are way, way, way more words of English that aren't in the dictionary than are in the dictionary. In fact, the majority of unique English words are not in traditional dictionaries. So the problem is pretty big. Because if you think about the English language, it's a very Lego-like language. You could take any word in the English language and add basically the prefix, suffix, or infix of your choice and um, uh, create a new word. And that word is perfectly cromulent, absolutely legit. and um, 
those words are not represented by and large. Like I saw a word in the New York Times this week, geo-arbitrage, which is when you live in a very cheap place like the Ukraine, but make money <laughs> working for people um, who are in an expensive place. Uh, yeah, and that, that word, as far as I know, is not in dictionaries. So with WordNick, we try to have every word. And it's a nonprofit now. We're now a 501c3 because we didn't make money as a venture-backed startup. And um, <laughs> seriously. And so like, um, it's a big online dictionary. We also have an API that has more than 20,000 registered developers. And people, DuckDuckGo uses our API. And uh, people use our API to make a lot of apps to help you cheat at Scrabble. And this is kind of what it looks like. So here's a word that doesn't have a dictionary definition, but it is a completely kick-ass word. So the way we have more words than anybody else is that we find example sentences, ergo zemblanity, the opposite of serendipity, the faculty of making unhappy, unlucky, and expected discoveries by design. So zemblanity is the opposite of serendipity. All of you now know what the word zemblanity is without ever reading a definition for it. So this is how we add words to WordNick, by trying to find sentences that act like definitions. We call them free-range definitions. And you know, there was the little highlight there. And then we also add like you know, user-generated content type stuff, like letting you know how many people have looked up this word. Um, everybody know what a hagiothesium is? Good. It's a very obscure word. It's a small traveling case containing Byzantine portraits of saints. You all have one, right? <laughs> I didn't bring mine tonight because I thought TSA was going to confiscate it. But like, yeah, so this is kind of the kind of data that we collect. And this is what our API looks like. Um, so fun fact, WordNick is actually where Swagger was invented. My technical co-founder, Tony Tam, is the guy behind Swagger. And yeah, and so he made it because he was, my joke is, that he made it because he was really tired of me asking him what all the APIs did. <laughs> so, because before I started working on WordNick, I had written enough bad Perl scripts to like get me banned from coding if that was a thing. <laughs> and so really picked up a lot while I was working with him. So we have to make money though. As a nonprofit, we have to support ourselves. And the way that we support ourselves right now is by some paid API use and by people adopting a word on WordNick. So for example, the wonderful Max Mechanic adopted the word cromulent. It costs $25, it lasts for a year, I give you stickers and a downloadable certificate that you can hang on your wall that you're like, I adopted this word. And I was using a, um, I was using kind of a database as a service when I started this, and they went end of life. They went end of life really quickly and very painfully. But I was like, I just found out about Loopback. So I was able to replace this database as a service very quickly with Loopback, so I could do this. And um, I will show you, actually, before we go to question time, uh, what that looks like. So I have actually the code, so let's take a look at that. So one of the things you can do with WordNick is you can write custom endpoints. So I wrote some custom endpoints for the adoption data. So I have a couple of functions that help me check things. So I need to know, for each user of WordNick, how many words that they've adopted, because I show it on their user page. So I was just able to drop down directly into Mongo syntax and say, hey, find me all where the WordNick username is the username, and give me back that data. I can also find all the words that have expired, so I can send them a friendly reminder that they should send us another $25. And then I can find all the words that were um, created on a particular date because as I was using the former database as a service, because it was schemaless, it was a non-relational, a non-document database, like a non, it was a Mongo type database, a document database. I could add to the schema as I went along. And at first I only had date created and not date expired. So I need two different endpoints so that I can get all the particular data. And so I am running that API also locally on this machine. So I can show you what that looks like with some test data, but I'm running it on a different port. Oh wait, maybe it's not running. Oh, you're right, I'm not running it. Okay. It's not a demo of something doesn't break. So here's what it looks like. I highlighted the, the custom endpoints. So let's, uh, let's find all of the words adopted by my favorite fake user, Fakey McFakey Pants. 
Oh yeah. Fakey McFakey Pants has adopted the wonderful words test word three, <laughs> test word 10, <laughs> test word six. They're a really big supporter of word neck actually. Test word two, test word four, and test word 11. So I'm not just a fan of word neck. I am also a client. <laughs> and uh, I find that I really like using loopback for stuff like this because it's, it's a known uh, property, right? I know how it's going to behave. I know how it's going to interact with my data store. It does all of the basic boring things that you don't want to write, like, you know, find one by ID, get all. Nobody enjoys writing that cruft, right? Like that's the boring stuff that you wade through in order to get to your business logic, which matters. And because I am now a full stack engineer by default on WordNet, I have to do all of the things. I answer the customer support email, I fix the bugs, I update the APIs at a glacial pace. This makes it faster for me to do these things and I don't waste my very precious Sundays, which is when I work on WordNet now, on writing get one by ID. I let Loopback do that for me. And um, anyway, I am happy to Let's see, go back here and answer questions. And I also am the founder of the Semicolon Appreciation Society. <laughs> and I, <coughs> <coughs> I have Semicolon Appreciation Society stickers to give away. I hope I, I hope I have enough. You can appreciate the semicolon from whatever distance you like. If you like the semicolon better when it is far away from you, that is still appreciating it. <laughs> Um, I do ask though, like oftentimes people come up to me for stickers and after I've given them a sticker, they say, I'm going to put this on my coworker's laptop. He hates semicolons. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, you can, you can put it on your stuff and just like kind of flaunt it, but try not to like vandalize other people's or government property with these stickers <laughs> if, if you get it. Nice. So anyway, uh, thank you so much. All of the images that uh, aren't WordNick images are licensed uh, Creative Commons images, which means this entire presentation is Creative Commons. So if you would like these slides to give a completely different talk using the same slides, <laughs> images in a different order, um, I'm happy to make them available to you. So no one has ever taken me up on this. <laughs> um, but I really appreciate the like eight people who still upload to Flickr so that I can um, <laughs> find these great images which really help me make slides. But now I want to make slides on the fly. I mean, I've seen lots of demos that live code, but I've never seen live slides. <laughs> that was kind of awesome. Anyway, thank you so much for your kind attention. <laughs> So I really isn't joking about the stickers. But if anyone has questions, I think we have like one yeah. minute for questions. Let me take, uh, two questions. Two questions, yes. Uh, any plans for GraphQL support? God, no. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so yes, I understand GraphQL is awesome and GitHub uses it. Oh, do you mean me personally or Loopback? Loopback, yes. <laughs> Their plans, <laughs> yeah. I do not plan. I do not plan any GraphQL support for WordNick because uh, the kinds of queries that you could make against a database of 10 million plus words with GraphQL just make just make my skin crawl. Like I feel like you could really trounce everything if you didn't know what you were doing, and I don't know what I'm doing with GraphQL. So yes, but Loopback has significant plans for GraphQL, none of which I can talk about. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, while you were creating your models, if you were uh -huh. using a relational database, would it ask you if there's a relationship for this problem to another, another model? Yes, and Loopback has built in like all of the kind of standard relational database relationships. It has built in, um, and you actually set those up. Um, you set those up, kind of. Uh, you can set them up in a separate pass in the CLI. So you set up the names first and then you set up the relationships. And I can show you, um, just looking at the code really fast, you don't have to go through the CLI to do stuff. Everything gets shoved into a text file. So if you make a typo, you can just go into the text file and edit it. Um, your data source also, um, it also, um, Loopback is like kind of 12 factor app aware. So you can set up different environments for different data sources. So you can have your local one, like I have here, 
um, because I, this example I'm actually doing in production, here's the version of the data source that I used for testing with CircleCI, right? And which I probably should put somewhere else. And um, yeah, so here's the development one. And so if I ever changed this database, I could just edit it here without going back to the CLI. So I actually deploy this loopback app using Elastic Beanstalk to Amazon because they gave me like a buttload of free credits. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, and it was very simple to just deploy it. It's just a node app, right? So, cool. Thanks, y'all. Right.